Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson, Ms. Lee. Thank you, Chairman Alexander and Senator Murray for your vision and for this opportunity to offer my remarks regarding the impact of testing and accountability on our public school children. I'm also a parent of a sixth grader, 11 year old, and so I speak to you both as a public school parent and as a teacher. I wanna provide some context that I've learned about the current educational policies, and they're driven by business. The use of competitive performance-based practices have long been assumed to motivate workers. Microsoft, Expedia, and Adobe systems are just some of the companies who adopted stack ranking, the now infamous practice of applying rewards, consequences, and rankings based on performance. These same business advisors have informed many of our nation's biggest districts, including mine. In the past few years, these businesses have abandoned this practice because they have proven to have disastrous effects on collaboration, problem solving, and innovation. What was bad for business has been disastrous for public education, a field already plagued with recruitment and retention challenges. I've worked in different schools. Some of them, through no fault of their own, have become increasingly data-driven as opposed to student-driven. I'm fortunate currently to be working in a public school that was founded on the principles of whole child education, where we teachers collaborate, develop curriculum, and create relevant assessments. It is the antithesis of stack ranking. This year, our fourth and fifth graders are immersed in a study we call rights and responsibilities. Students develop questions around the origins of the United States, the Constitution, and discuss the complex struggles and progresses we have made as a nation. These are eight to 10 year olds. My class decided to divide themselves into groups to study three different perspectives from the colonial era, the native peoples, the European colonists, and the African slaves. They are the researchers. My integrated co-teaching classroom consists of students with disabilities, or I should say, all abilities. And they work in heterogeneous groups to present their understandings through a variety of mediums. They are learning how to learn developing lifelong skills, researching, analyzing information from multiple sources, collaborating with others, and sharing what they've learned in creative and thought-provoking ways. They are the stewards of their learning, guided by their interests and passions. I share this not as a best practice, but to emphasize the importance of fostering learning environments that value a culture of trust, diversity, and autonomy, not a focus on test preparation. Teachers' working conditions are inextricably tied to students' learning conditions. When parents and educators have voiced concerns, they've been accused of coddling. I want to challenge that assumption. The great crime is that the focus on testing has taken valuable resources and time away from programming, social studies, arts and physical education, special education services, and ELL programs. At my school, we no longer have a librarian and our parent association works full time to fund the needed arts and music programs that are not covered by our budget any longer. And we are one of the lucky schools. What about schools where parents must work to just survive? There is nothing more painful to watch or forced to be complicit with than the minimalizing that is happening in our schools. Teachers, students, and parents are finding themselves in a position of whether or not to push back or leave. So who is left to receive these tests and accompanying sanctions? Who are the children receiving scripted curricula while losing recess physical education and all other enrichment programs? Last year, over 50% of our parents at our school refused to allow their children to take the New York State Common Core assessments, what we now have known nationally as opting out. And we were not alone. I want to remind folks that the Latin root of assessment needs to sit alongside. Until we have teachers and policymakers sitting alongside and getting to know our students in our classrooms in deep and meaningful ways, we cannot fully understand the state of public education. And I sit here as a sole female, and this is a field dominated by women. No corporate made multiple choice test will give you that data. Last year I decided that I'm obligated and accountable to my students and their families, and that is why as a teacher of conscience, I will refuse to administer tests that reduce my students to a single metric and will continue to take this position until the role of standardized assessments are put in their proper place. We just celebrated the life of Martin Luther King Jr. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, King affirms, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. He quotes St. Augustine who said, an unjust law is no law at all. 
so long as education policy continues to be shaped by the interests of corporate profiteering and not the interests of our public school children, we will resist these unjust testing laws. I am hopeful that we can sit alongside each other and do the hard work of answering the questions most central to our democracy. What is the purpose of public education in a, dem in a democratic society? How can we ensure that all children receive enriching and equitable education? And how do we support teachers and schools in carrying out their missions to educate all? I want to thank you, and I appreciate all of your coming questions. Thank you, Ms. Lee.